In this fifth episode in our Antenna Brief series, we're going to look at electric and magnetic fields and at EM waves, electromagnetic waves. As we've alluded to in past episodes, these fields underlie everything we do with antennas. So it seems prudent to try to understand them in some detail. We can do that by looking at the illustration here on the left that we've talked about a little bit in previous episodes, or by looking at illustrations such as the one on the right here that you may find on the internet. But that will only take us so far. So, as this material is based on and supports university courses, we do need to show a little bit of math and talk about it briefly. However, we're not going to go into this in detail. Instead, we're going to concentrate on some basic engineering results, such as shown on this slide. In the circuit domain, we talk about power and voltage and current. But those have their analog in the fields domain. So power in the circuits domain is V squared over R, as many of you know. And in the fields domain, it's power density in watts per square meter, and it's E squared over Z naught. So we're going to concentrate on results like those that will allow us to do things, for example, look at field strength rules and figure out how much power a transmitter can put out and not violate rules. So let's dive in and review how antennas work. On the left is a dipole antenna that's transmitting to a dipole antenna on the right. Between them is a so-called nano vector network analyzer, or nano VNA, that has the transmitter in it and a receiver in it. And we've covered that in previous videos, so I'm not going to go into that in detail here. Our interest in this episode is how does the signal get from the left antenna to the right antenna? And as we've talked about before, that deals with electric fields and magnetic fields that the antenna creates. Now, what are those fields? We call them the electric field, E, and the magnetic field, B. And we're going to talk in some detail about those fields today. And the goal is going to be to figure out how strong the fields are, for the reasons we mentioned, as well as how much signal can we get into the receive antenna. Now, it all starts when we put a voltage on the transmit antenna, and some current flows in the elements of that antenna. And there may be a transmission line between the transmit voltage and that antenna feed point. So let's talk about that for a minute. Where does the transition from voltage and current change to electric field and magnetic field? Well, it starts in the transmission line that connects the transmitter to the antenna itself. These are a couple of screenshots from a different series on this channel uh, called the Nano VNA series. And in that, we looked at a transmission line, in particular a coax, and talked about signal reflections on that coax. Forward traveling waves and backward traveling waves and SWR and return loss and things that some of you know about, especially if you're ham radio operators. But here, let's just look at what that coax configuration looks like. It has a center conductor and an outer conductor. And over on the right, we have an illustration that basically summarizes some key points from that previous video in the Nano VNA series. We take a sine wave voltage source and we connect it to the coax. And what happens is some current flows in. So you have voltage and current, which means you have power coming in, V squared over Z naught, where in the case of the coax we're using, Z naught is the so-called characteristic impedance of the coax, which in this case is 50 ohms. And that injection of power into the coax, voltage times current, or voltage squared divided by 50 ohms, happens because the coax itself has capacitances and inductances in it. Capacitances exist from the center lead to the outer shield. And if this is a very high frequency, a radio frequency, even a small amount of capacitance will conduct current through it, so-called displacement current. So you get current entering this conductor. Further down, there's more capacitance, and there's also inductance along the way. Why? Because as current flows in here, we get a magnetic field B that wraps around that conductor. And we're going to talk more about that today. 
So coming back to our experimental setup and the associated diagram, a voltage source inside the nano VNA sets up current and voltage waves that flow down this coax in the form of electric and magnetic fields. Now at the far end is the feed point of the antenna, illustrated here on the right, and that current continues into these antenna elements. Why? Well, because this rod has some capacitance to the other rod. So the voltage and current are transferred to the antenna elements, with the voltage producing electric field between the two elements, and the currents producing magnetic field or B field around those elements. And so for reasons we're going to discuss in this episode, those electric and magnetic fields propagate out away from the antenna and eventually get to the receive antenna. Now, depending on your background, this kind of a diagram may mean a lot to you or a little to you. So we're going to delve into what exactly are electric and magnetic fields before we start trying to get into details about how this is all working. And here's how we're going to break down that discussion. We're going to start with a very brief review of electric and magnetic fields. And then we'll look at, very briefly, Maxwell's equations, but the main results from those in terms of what is an electromagnetic wave and how can we describe that in a useful way that can allow us to do some engineering. And that engineering has to do with determining the electric field strength because a lot of things we care about depend on what the value of that E field strength is. And the E field strength, as the signal propagates away from the transmit antenna, depends on the direction that we're talking about. Broadside to the antenna, which is this direction, the field is maximum. But end fire up here, the field actually goes to zero. And at other elevation angles, the field is different. OK, let's dive into electric and magnetic fields. What is an electric or E field? And how do we quantify it? Well, if we have two packets of charge, we'll call one Q1 and the other one Q2, and they're both positive, then there's a force between them that pushes them apart. And a long time ago, Coulomb looked into this and determined that the force was equal to the product of the two charges divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, where that's just some physical constant, uh, times r squared, where r is the distance between them. But as the theories were further developed, it became apparent that it was more useful to talk about something we call an electric field surrounding just one group of those charges. Here uh, it's Q1, and so I've renamed that just Q. And Q2 has been reduced to a tiny little test charge, little Q sub t. And now we don't think directly about the force between them. We think indirectly about it in terms of the electric field. And that electric field is defined as the force divided by Q sub t. Or, using a little algebra, uh, if we know the electric field and we bring in a charge, call it Q sub t or call it whatever you want, uh, that charge times the electric field equals the force that that charge will experience. So that's the utility of knowing E. The other important things to note are that E is measured in volts per meter. That's going to come in very important later. What about the magnetic field, or the B field? Well, the B field is a bit more complicated, as you can see from this expression on the left. Below it is an illustration of a segment of wire right here with some charges in it, some of which are mobile. If this is metal, then it's usually the electrons that move and the positive charges are parts of the metal atomic structure and they stay in place. Some of the electrons in a metal are loosely bound to the atoms and so they can move. And that movement of charge, of course, is current. So let's just focus on I here, the current. There's current flowing in this wire. And when you have that, you get a magnetic field around it. And that magnetic field B can be found using the bios of art law in this equation. We're, we're not going to do that right here. Let's go to a simplified case on the right. This is what you get if you're close to the wire. If your observation point is close to the wire, say right here, and the wire is much longer than the distance from there to our observation point, uh, 
then we'll consider that close to the wire. And under this condition, the B field is found as I divided by 2 pi r times another physical constant called mu naught, the permeability. And here's the value of the permeability of free space. Now, since mu depends on the material you're in, we sometimes separate out that material dependent mu from the main magnetizing force, which is I over 2 pi r. And we call that latter H. So B is equal to mu times H. And H is in amps per meter. Now, there are a lot of details that we're skipping over here. And other laws, such as Faraday's law, that links magnetism to electricity. But for the purpose of keeping this video manageable, we're not going to get into that. Instead, I would refer you to, for example, a good electromagnetics textbook. This is one of my favorites. It's by um, William Haight. And I actually have the fifth edition, and I find it to be very, very good. Uh, it is unfortunately out of print. The later editions may be as good as well. I don't know. But let's move on to our main topics today. The next one being electromagnetic waves. So what's an electromagnetic wave? Well, as the name implies, it is a combination of electric and magnetic fields that propagate away from the transmit antenna in our case. And the power and energy carried by that electromagnetic wave that left the transmitter moves here to the right at the speed of light. And the key to conceptualizing this is to understand that this picture on the left and the picture on the right are actually snapshots in time. So if you were able to take a picture of electric and magnetic fields, they might look like the picture, for example, on the right, which I got off the internet from this address. But you see these kind of pictures all over the place. What does it mean? Well, the vertical axis is the electric field strength, and the horizontal axis, this one here, is the magnetic field strength. And if you freeze time at a particular time and look at or illustrate how strong the fields are at any given point in space, where space is this axis, the field strengths map out sinusoidal waves. But the key thing to understand here is this picture changes if you go to a different time. The picture shifts to the right. And the same thing is true of our diagram on the left. These field lines are moving to the right, as indicated by the arrow here that says radiation. So let's say we just sit at this location in space. At this instant in time, the electric field is downward directed, and the magnetic field is directed into the page. But if we wait a half cycle more, which at a frequency of 1 gigahertz would be half a nanosecond, then what will happen is the field that was over here has now moved over to here, so the electric field, as seen at this location, half cycle later, will be pointing upward. And the magnetic field will be pointed out of the page. So if we stand here and observe, the electric field will be upward directed, downward directed, upward directed, and it'll change in a sinusoidal fashion. And you could picture that by sitting at a given point on this axis here and imagining this diagram moving to the right. And it does that at the velocity c, the speed of light. Now, to understand that in greater depth, we need a coordinate axis and we need calculus. Specifically, vector calculus and Maxwell's equations. And the trouble with equations is that it takes a very long time to digest what they're trying to say, even if you have the background to understand the vector calculus. One should never do what I'm doing here, which is put a bunch of equations on a slide and expect anybody to follow it. But what I will say is that Maxwell's equations have a solution that looks like what we see in the lower left here. And the main things I want to say about this solution are, number one, the electric field, which is x-directed, x is going up, and all these electric fields are x-directed if you're out here to the right broadside to the antenna. So I'm assuming that you're looking at it out here somewhere. 
and the electric field that you'll see at that location is sinusoidal. Here I wrote it as a cosine. And it has a certain frequency. What's that frequency? Well, it depends on the source. But notice that this rather involved expression for the electric field is actually the same for the magnetic field. The only difference is in magnitude. The magnetic field is the electric field strength divided by the speed of light. And what that means is the electric and magnetic fields are very tightly linked. In fact, one could say they're virtually the same thing. And that's why on our title slide we didn't illustrate both electric and magnetic fields. We just illustrated some wave fronts leaving the transmit antenna and going toward the receive antenna. And I usually think of these lines as being the peaks of the wave fronts. So at the time this picture is representing the peak electric field is right here. And then there's another peak back here and another one back here. And what's the distance between them? Well, that's the wavelength of the signal. And these peaks are moving out away from the transmit antenna at the speed of light in this direction. So, recognizing that the electric and magnetic fields are pretty much one and the same, at least in the far field when you're far away from the transmit antenna, we can concentrate on just, for example, the electric field. The next question is, how strong is that electric field? And that is our next topic. Here's an example of why it's important to know things like that. If you want to build and market a transmitter, for example, you will have to follow the rules. And sometimes those rules will not tell you directly what you want to know. For example, what is the maximum power? Instead, the rules may say things like the field strength of any emissions shall not exceed 250 microvolts per meter at 3 meter distance. Or you may be interested if it's safe to be close to a particular radio transmitter. And here's an example of a manual I found on the web titled Electromagnetic Field Measurements to Assess Human Exposure. And those are given in electric field strength units of volts per meter. So let's look at example one. How can we find the maximum legal transmit power for an unlicensed FM transmitter? We know the field strength cannot be larger than 250 microvolts per meter at 3 meters. So to solve this problem, we have to bring in something called the pointing vector. Our electromagnetic field is carrying a certain amount of power with it. And that power ultimately came from the transmitter on the left. And in circuits, we know that the transmit power is the transmit voltage times the transmit current. Or, if we have a resistive input impedance for our antenna, in this case a half-wave dipole, which is known to be 73 ohms, we can just do V squared over R to figure out the power. And that power leaves our transmit antenna, goes out in all directions, and as we've discussed in previous episodes, the power density at a given distance d from the transmit antenna is the transmit power times the gain of that antenna divided by 4 pi d squared. Now an important caveat, this assumes that we're operating in what's called the far field. We're far enough away from this antenna that the fields behave as we're about to discuss. And in general that's a few wavelengths, although it depends on the physical extent of the antenna. We've also assumed in this expression that we're in free space. There's no obstructions in the way or multipath in our environment. So we've seen this expression before for the power density. What's new here is the so-called pointing vector, the E field times the H field. And remember, the E field is in volts per meter, and the H field is in amps per meter, so conveniently, the product is going to be in volt amps per meter squared. A volt amp is volts times amps, which is power in watts. So we're watts per square meter. So this is kind of easy to remember. If you think of E like voltage and H like current, it's no different than voltage times current in the circuit domain, except for the units are on a per square meter basis. Similarly, we can show that this can be reduced to E squared over Z naught, just as in the antenna, we had VT squared over R antenna. So that one's easy to remember too. 
Now, what is Z0? Z0 is found from Maxwell's equations. But fortunately, we don't have to do that. Somebody already did it. And it's equal to the square root of mu0 over epsilon0 in free space. And that's the magic number, 377 ohms. So from this somewhat busy slide, here are the important bits. The power density at a distance d is given by this formula. But now we have it in a different form, and we can solve for e once we know what this is, like we've solved for in previous episodes. So let's do that for the case of a dipole antenna. On the left is what we had on the previous slide, the important parts. And then we've used some algebra to back solve for E, and it's this expression here. And with a little bit more algebra on that expression, we can solve for the power. In our example problem, we know that E is limited to 250 microvolts per meter at 3 meters. So E is 250 times 10 to the minus 6th. Z0 is 377, and D is 3 meters. And from previous episodes, we know that if we're using a dipole antenna, then the transmit antenna gain is 1.6 in the broadside direction. So we can punch some numbers into the calculator, and out pops PT is 11.6 nanowatts. That's the kind of power level that a legal commercial FM broadcast unlicensed transmitter can put out. And in dBm, that's uh, close to minus 50 dBm. It's minus 49 dBm. So in our radio engineering courses at the university, we make sure that we stay within the legal limits. This is an example of a student designed and built FM transmitter. The oscillator is here. The modulator is in this block. And then we had an amplifier and a harmonic filter on the way out. But when we test this over the air, we don't want to violate the limits. So when we test it over the air, we used a 60 dB attenuator because with the amplifier, this puts out about plus 10 dBm. You can see an example of the FM spectrum back here. Uh, that's with the transmitter connected directly to the spectrum analyzer. But when we go to this antenna, we go through the attenuator. One more important reason why it's important to be able to calculate the E-field strength is we can use it to figure out the signal that actually gets into a receiver. And that's illustrated on this slide. Remember, the electric field is in volts per meter. So if you want to figure out the voltage that gets into the receiver over here, you need volts per meter times meters. And the meters involved is the length of the antenna but it's something called the effective length, so it's not quite the same as the physical length. For a half-wave dipole, the physical length is the wavelength lambda divided by 2, but there's an adjustment factor of 2 over pi, which is about 2 thirds. So I'm noticing this video is getting kind of long, so I think I'm going to cut it off here. And we'll save these two last topics for Antenna Brief 6. And in Antenna Brief 6, we'll also look at the physics behind all of this, just a tiny little bit. Uh, because I have this question, what are electric and magnetic and EM fields exactly? It's always bothered me that electric fields seem somewhat straightforward. You bring a charge into the proximity of other charges and you get a force on it in the direction of the E field. But in the magnetic field world, if you have a current going in this direction, then the B field is perpendicular to it. So what starts out as a unit vector A sub R pointing from the wire to the observation point gets rotated 90 degrees to create a B field that goes into the board in this illustration. And then if there's a moving charge over here, that B field vector is rotated again and points back into the wire that started all this. So in our next video, we'll take a brief look at alternative ways of viewing things like the magnetic force. If you bring in relativity theory, it can actually be explained as Coulomb force. But as always, our primary focus is going to be on engineering, understanding how to make and use antennas.
And one of our primary objectives is going to be looking at antenna simulation software and how that actually works. So that's it for now. Please check back in a couple or a few weeks. And I once again thank you for watching. I hope this has been educational. And I hope you'll join us for that and future upcoming videos.